D. James Kennedy Ministries presents Truths That Transform. The overheated political climate today challenges the American tradition of the peaceful transfer of power. But what is behind the protests and disrespect for our Constitution? We take a look at the Marxist roots of the current dissent movement on this edition of Truths That Transform. Does the Bible teach socialism? What would you say to those who claim it does? You'll find the answers in the booklet, Does the Bible Teach Socialism? From the new Truth in Action question and answer series. This eight page booklet lays out the arguments on both sides in a clear and concise way. It gives you the biblical talking points to be able to answer those who claim the Bible mandates socialism. To get your copy, please call, write, or go online and be sure to include a generous donation towards the ongoing work of this ministry. And we'll send you the new Truth in Action Q&A booklet, Does the Bible Teach Socialism? Welcome to Truths That Transform, a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries, where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. There is a movement in America which aims to eradicate Christian morals and ethics and divide us along racial, sexual, and gender identity lines. This is nothing other than cultural Marxism. On today's program, you will learn more about this movement and better understand what you see happening in the culture today. And we will share some important resources for helping you understand the flaws of socialism and Marxism. As we begin, this movement has shown itself nowhere more than on America's college campuses. Dr. Carol Swain is a professor of political science and law at Vanderbilt University. And I recently had a chance to sit down and talk with her about cultural Marxism in the academy. Well, Carol, thanks for being with us today. I'm delighted to have you on the program. Hey, it's my pleasure. It seems to me that Marxism is on the rise in college campuses today. Do you see it that way, or am I just looking too much at small things? Nowadays, people don't go around saying, I'm a Marxist, because the whole environment, you know, it just reeks of Marxism. They're pretty much infiltrated the institution to the point that they don't have to declare they're Marxist. They just have taken the Marxist ideals I don't think they even know that what they're doing is uh, Marxism, certainly cultural Marxism. And uh, the whole idea of cultural Marxism changing the culture mm -hmm. so that people will, will accept uh, things that run counter you know, to their traditions and values and principles. Uh, that had to be done first to get the people prepared so that you could have them ready for something more extreme. And socialism, you know, was supposed to be like the first step towards communism sure. where the state would wither away. The roots of socialism are atheistic, correct? Yes. I mean, Karl Marx said that uh, religion was the opium of the masses. Mm -hmm. And why is it necessary for socialists and communists to argue that there is no God? I think that uh, for commun socialism and communism to work as Karl Marx uh, envisioned, you have to destroy the family and uh, you have to destroy the church. Cleon Skousen was a former FBI agent and professor that wrote a book called The Naked Communist. And in his appendix, he identified uh, what was then uh, 45 current communist goals, and I believe his book was published in 1958, but part of it was uh, to take infiltrate the churches, take over the schools, uh, promote homosexuality as natural and healthy, uh, to establish relationships with communist China, and there's a whole list of goals, and most of them have been accomplished, 
and Democratic presidents as well as Republican presidents and members of Congress have all cooperated towards the, this grand vision. But part of that vision is to destroy the family as we know it today. And what we see when we look out on the horizon, many people, and I think some of the students I've had in the past thought, oh, this is the natural progression. You know, society is progressing, it's evolving to something better. They didn't realize that this was just uh, the fulfillment of a vision that people had, you know, decades ago, 100 years ago. And so what you see today is um, people pushing the restrictions on language. The university is no longer a marketplace of ideas. Religion is the, uh, mo has always been just the most threatening factor. And you see that on the college and university campuses where they've ousted uh, the Christian groups, the ones that are Bible-believing conservatives. Is there any such thing as free speech in a Marxist-dominated environment? In my classroom, at least, students know that they can express themselves. But in most conversations, people are so careful about what they're going to say, or they're so apologetic, and so they're so afraid um, if it's someone of a different race that they might, you know, say something wrong, or they might call you African-American when you want to be called black, or they may be guilty of cultural appropriations. An example of that would be maybe there's a white person that wants to wear their hair in braids or uh, even cooking food of a different culture. Uh, in this Marxist-like environment, that could be offensive to someone. And so everyone is trying not to offend, and I find it very offensive myself. Yeah. You know, that uh, people that are conservative that have my values and my views we don't matter. So when there's talk of diversity and inclusion, it doesn't mean us. Right. It means everybody but us, typically. The political left has used epithets, mm -hmm. shaming techniques, to silence and browbeat Christians. And I believe that we have to stand up to it, that if a person knows that they're right, they should not allow themselves to be intimidated because someone calls them a bigot or nativist or go down the list, we ha actually have the truth on our side. And what we have to remember is that if we endure, that what we do glorifies Jesus. So if God is sovereign over all things, he's sovereign over all of our struggles too, isn't he? Yes. The Bible says, greater is he that is within than he that is within the world. It's a true statement. And for some Christians, I think if you never experienced God, if you're not in that personal relationship, then you're missing what it's all about. As Carol Swain reminds us of what is really happening on today's college campuses, it's important to be mindful of the education of today's young people. All false ideologies, including Marxism and socialism, begin with a mistaken idea of the nature of human beings and the God who created them. Dr. D. James Kennedy exposes the roots of these errors in this portion of his message, Where Did We Go Wrong? If I were to ask you today what were the two most important events in the history of this world, I wonder what you'd say. Well, I'm sure some might say the discovery of fire, the invention of the wheel, the discovery of electricity or atomic energy, the Norman conquest of England, the crossing of the Rubicon, the dropping of the atomic bomb, the invention of flight. Many things would certainly come to mind, but I would suggest that the two most Im important events in the history of the world are those described by Paul in the fifth chapter of Romans. The fall of mankind into sin through Adam and his redemption through the second Adam, Jesus Christ. These were far and away the most important events in history. Why is it so important? Well, Richard Bozarth, an atheist, writing in The American Atheist, tells very clearly from their perspective why they feel it's so important. Quote, destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God, small s, small g. 
You take away the meaning of his death. If Jesus was not the redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, he says, that Jesus is not the redeemer who died for our sins, then he continues, Christianity is nothing. And you certainly can see that all around us today in our time. And it all began with a covenant, an agreement between God and man, where God drew a line and said that he was the creator, he was God, and man was the creature. Man was but, but a human being, and there must be a line drawn. And so he said, you may eat freely of all of the trees of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat thereof, lest ye die. God is a God of love. But Satan would portray him as a narrow, jealous God who doesn't want them to enjoy life. Here they've been given all manner of freedom but they're not satisfied. She's not satisfied unless she can have absolute freedom, total license. Also, we see here that Satan holds before her the prospect that she shall become like God. And here is this ancient idea which is revived again in our time. That is the essence of the new age. When you boil it all down to the bottom line, you find that the essence of New Ageism is that you can become God. And that's what all of these New Age writers are proclaiming today. You can be autonomous. You can be a law unto yourself. Going all the way back, even as the humanists did, to Protagoras, who said that man is the measure of all things. Man will decide what is right and what is wrong. Man will decide what is good and what is evil, what is of value and what is not of value. Man will be God. And so Satan is still dangling that before the eyes and minds of men. It is a lie. It was a lie then. It is a lie now. What they took, she took and she ate and she gave to her husband and he ate and they died. Oh, they died physically hundreds of years later, but spiritually they died that very hour. And there was a corruption that began to take place in their lives. And God pronounced a curse upon them and upon the world. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, he said to Adam. Well, we have seen the incredible impact of that curse upon the world. We've seen how it affects society because of the fact that men have not believed this. They have rejected the doctrine of original sin because man is a fallen creature. He is a sinful creature. We have had educational systems which have produced all kinds of disaster. We have said that we're not going to teach them facts. We're not going to give them information. We're going to bring out of them what is inside of them. But Jesus told us what is inside of them, for out of the heart proceedeth all manner of evil, adultery and fornication, murder and theft, and on and on he went. We have tried to base one institution after another on the biblical error, the false teaching that man is essentially good, and consequently millions upon millions of people have suffered and died as a result. The second greatest fact in history is that Christ came and redeemed man from the effects of sin and from the dominion of death. I hope that you've experienced that redemption. If not, I urge you this day to put your trust in Christ, to rest upon him alone for your salvation, to receive him as Savior and Lord, to trust in his righteousness alone. Receive him. Trust in him. Be clothed in his righteousness, and you will rejoice with him forevermore. In his message today, Dr. Kennedy explained how education is failing because of the growing decline in belief in Judeo-Christian values. 
As students are falsely taught today that truth is relative, they become susceptible to a false and destructive worldview. Instead of the truth, we have your truth and my truth. With objective truth erased, identity becomes paramount. And the perfect dividing line for those who want a societal revolution from the inside out. All of this adds up to cultural Marxism. Here's John Rabe with more. Karl Marx, when he uh, created socialism, Marxist version of socialism, did so consciously as an alternative to the Christian religion. If we want to understand cultural Marxism, we need to understand Marxism. They're different, but they're in the same worldview of thought. The progressives introduced the intellectual grounding, if you will, the, the, the foundations of this new movement in America to change America, to transform it. The culture in America today is saturated with political correctness, social justice outrage, and so-called tolerance. This leftist ideology is far from tolerant, though, shutting down any opposition from the right and repressing freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution. I think that one of the great challenges of uh, of our age is um, making sure the schools are teaching things that are correct. I mean, you've got a lot of college campuses where there are more Marxists than there are capitalists. The reality is we're going to increasingly move toward socialism in America. I mean, right now we found in our study last month that 37 percent of Americans say they prefer socialism to capitalism. When you look at the millennial generation, it's a, a, a significant majority of them who prefer that. Dr. Peter Lilback is the president of the Providence Forum. He discusses the ideology of cultural Marxism and the source behind this movement. The issue that's going on here is a fascinating principle of what is called cultural Marxism. There was a man by the name of Marcuse in the Frankfurt School of the Communist Thought in Germany in the last century. Marcuse's uh, principles were developed in the aftermath of the collapse of the communist system because the economic revolution did not occur. And so as they reappraised the whole tradition, they said it's going to be a cultural battle, not an economic battle. And the cultural issue was how do we overcome the traditional Judeo-Christian values that have shaped Western civilization? Herbert Marcuse wrote that breaking down all norms, including those of religion, sexuality, gender, and family, even by force of government, are key elements to overturning what he said was a corrupt Western capitalistic society. It's a classic progressive notion of government, which is increasingly being centralized and involved in the economy, is now going to reach out and get more and more involved in social questions, in cultural questions, in environmental questions. And leftism is a nice word for cultural Marxism. It is now a Marxist approach that is seeking to say, I'm going to destroy any opposition. But we shut them down. Yeah. Yeah. Shut it down! Shut it down! Shut it down! The founding document of cultural Marxism is a 50-year-old essay by Marcuse called Repressive Tolerance that fueled the campus protests of the 60s in which he advocates for tolerance for movements from the left and intolerance for movements of the right. You don't give tolerance to the people who you say are in charge because in a Marxist system there's always a clash, the thesis, antithesis, synthesis, the cultural struggle. And so the white or the Christian or the Judeo-Christian, or the capitalist, or the American, whoever the enemy is, is always told you must tolerate, but we'll never tolerate you. The obvious and ludicrous irony in the teachings of Marcuse is that he claims the left should be intolerant and repressive in order to have ultimate tolerance and liberty. We see this contradiction being played out in society today, such as when conservative political scientist Charles Murray was attacked at Middlebury College by those who felt his research wasn't deferential enough to minorities. They attacked him in the name of tolerance. Hundreds protesting against a man they feel is a white supremacist. He's got a message that is not something that I think is tolerant, uh, amounts to hate speech, and I feel particularly strongly that the college should not be endorsing it, and I think they are implicitly, maybe explicitly endorsing it. The tentacles of cultural Marxism are everywhere. 
It frames society as a battle between the powerful majority and the disempowered minority and seeks to turn the tables. Whenever you hear terms like white privilege or heteronormative, you're hearing the battle cries of cultural Marxism. It's why advocates of homosexuality also defend radical Islam, even though radical Islam mandates the execution of homosexuals. And it's how you end up with absurd contradictions like a journalism professor angrily censoring a student journalist, as happened at the University of Missouri. I'm media. Can I talk to you? No, you need no. to get out. Well, you need to get out. No, I don't. You need to get out. I actually don't. All right. Hey, who wants to help me get this reporter out of here? I need some muscle over here. We need to know these principles, and we're largely living in a cocoon because we're not paying attention to them. Because we say communism died. Well, maybe economic communism died, but cultural Marxism is alive and well, and it's seeking to strangle us just as much as ever the Marxist tradition wanted to do. And so we must understand the truth, and I think that's the principle of why we need to gain a new understanding of the issues that are right before us right now. Cultural Marxism is alive and well. As you've just seen, the influence of Karl Marx and his followers continues. His socialistic movement shifts and changes shape even as government after government has failed using his economic ideas. Yet despite all the damage done by Marxist socialism, many today not only advocate it, but they even claim that the Bible mandates it. In reality, nothing could be further from the truth. And we have two important resources to help you, your children, and your grandchildren know the truth. Here's my friend Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy to tell us more. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Frank. The ideas of Karl Marx have led to more suffering than the world has ever known. Yet his ideas continue to permeate our universities, mutating into new and harmful offshoots. It's never been more important for you to understand the truth about socialism. We have two resources that you'll want to share with your children and grandchildren. We'll send them both to you as our thanks for your generous donation to the ongoing work of this ministry. The first is the hard-hitting book, 10 Truths About Socialism. This concise, easy-to-read book explains how socialism's founding fathers rejected God, how socialism violates God's law, and how socialism goes hand-in-hand -hand with tyranny. The second resource is the Truth in Action Q&A booklet, Does the Bible Teach Socialism? This short format is perfect for anyone who wants to know the truth about what the Bible says about socialism and wants to be able to talk about it intelligently. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339, or call toll-free 877-962-7677, or go online to djkm.org. With a recent poll showing that people under 30 have a more favorable view of socialism than of capitalism, our nation is at the edge of a crisis. A socialist candidate nearly won his party's presidential nomination last year. Yet worldwide, millions more have gone hungry, poor, and lacking in basic necessities under Karl Marx's socialism. And over a hundred million people have been killed over the past century under communism. The truth about Marx's philosophy must get out. You'll want these resources for yourself, and you'll want to share them with your family especially those who are in college. Please give a generous donation to this ministry today, and we'll send you the book, 10 Truths About Socialism, as well as the Truth in Action Q&A booklet, Does the Bible Teach Socialism?, which includes the central questions, the biblical answers, and the talking points on this important issue. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339. Or call toll-free, 877-962-7677. Or go online to djkm.org. The French Enlightenment writer Voltaire is generally credited with having said, I disapprove of what you say, 
but I will defend to the death your right to say it. This intellectual defense of dissent is part of the bedrock undergirding free speech. If my speech is truly free, then I must have the freedom to disagree and the liberty to say so. True freedom values and even encourages dissent. In our consideration of dissenting viewpoints, we sometimes learn something new, even if only to sharpen and more carefully define our own views. Yet in our day, we have the spectacle of what can only be called oxymoronic dissent, one that demands its own rights of free speech while at the same time working assiduously to deny yours. This is Voltaire stood on his head. This oxymoronic dissent is commonplace in our day. We see it on college campuses where administrators create so-called safe spaces where students can be shielded from viewpoints that make them uncomfortable. Now, I want you to note two things here. First, notice how many colleges look more like daycare centers for the prepubescent mind than the classical marketplace of ideas. And second, observe how the speech disfavored by these policies is almost always that coming from a moral or biblical perspective. Writing from the Birmingham jail, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King wrote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. His point being that to ignore the plight of African Americans then was to disregard future hazards to your own freedoms. And we might rightly infer from his words that restrictions on religious freedom anywhere are a threat to religious freedom everywhere. When we see religious speech or freedom constrained, even religious viewpoints with which we disagree, we must recognize it ultimately as a threat to all religious speech, especially the gospel. And in the end, the gospel is the only thing that will matter to those standing before the judgment seat of Christ. D. James Kennedy Ministries is standing for truth and defending your freedom. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us for Truths That Transform. We'll see you next time. Next week on Truths That Transform. Political correctness is, is a cancer on the American landscape. And it is time that Christians stand up against political correctness. A godly mother is a great blessing. And one of the highest callings in all of the world. That's next week. Today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.